That's Abraham Lincoln. That is Abraham Lincoln, the president of the United States. That is Abraham Lincoln. That's that's uh, Abe Lincoln. That's Abraham Lincoln. Oh, okay. That is that is Abraham Lincoln. Yes. That is Thaddeus Stevens. That's Thaddeus Stevens. That is Thaddeus Stevens. Oh God, why am I blanking? It's the other. Is it Jefferson Davis? Mead. No, that's Mead. That is George Gordon Mead. I believe that is Robert E. Lee, the Confederate general. That is Robert E. Lee. That's Lee. Lee. I'm Lean and Lee. I think that's General Lee. That is Stonewall Jackson. I do not know. <laughs> I do not know who that is. I have no... Is that Jefferson Davis again? Uh, can you zoom on his face? I can't see him. I've got no clue. <laughs> Edward McPherson was a Gettysburgian whose name has never received the same level of fame as many others who passed through America's most famous small town. Unlike Abraham Lincoln, Thaddeus Stevens, or Dwight Eisenhower, McPherson's connection to Gettysburg is generally limited to the name of a ridge. Yet the hidden figure of Edward McPherson was a dynamic, multifaceted one, whose reach extended to the highest legislative bodies, the smallest businesses, and the bloodiest battles of the Civil War era. He was dedicated to the preservation of the Union, a country whose ideals he believed were within reach if only its people tried hard enough, and the eradication of slavery, a battle whose major victory he not only lived to see, but helped to achieve, while always staying tied to his home, Gettysburg. It was there that he found his voice and first articulated his moral and political philosophy. Across the state, he developed as a journalist, while his principles on the key issues of government and slavery matured. In the Capitol and the courtroom, he fought to preserve the victory and history of the American Civil War. Despite political opposition, economic setbacks, and physical ailments, McPherson succeeded in saving the things he held most dear. Edward McPherson's family had been here in Gettysburg long before he was born. His great-grandfather, Robert, settled in what would become Adams County in 1738 and was a member of the Pennsylvania Constitutional Convention, which led to one of the most radically democratic state constitutions. He epitomized both the promises and the consequences of the revolutionary American dream as he claimed land, built a home, and generated a small amount of family wealth. At the same time, the land he claimed had been stolen from Native Americans and his wealth was built on the backs of enslaved laborers. Robert's son, William, served as a soldier during the American Revolution and spent time as a prisoner of war after the Battle of Long Island. He also increased the family's number of slaves to at least 11 as the family's importance and wealth grew. It is clear that Edward McPherson would descend from a line of men who both fought valiantly and bravely for independence and freedom, yet also held other human beings in a state of bondage. The post-revolutionary family would rise to great influence and prosperity, but such a meteoric rise was only possible through the use of unpaid labor. Edward would inherit their love for country, but not their human property. His father, John, was born into this family wealth, but no evidence can be found showing that he ever owned or purchased slaves of his own, even though two of his brothers did. He became cashier of the Bank of Gettysburg, where he established a small fortune. During his time at the bank, he worked closely with influential members of the board, including Thaddeus Stevens and the Weirman and Wirt families. Each of them was noted for their anti-slavery views, and other abolitionists claimed that Stevens and the board threatened financial pressure against anyone who colluded with slave catchers in the area. There is not sufficient evidence to know how much, if at all, John McPherson was aware of this anti-slavery activity, but it is obvious that he experienced both sides of the debate around human bondage in the early Republic. The peculiar institution was an especially contentious one in Gettysburg, which rests just above the Mason-Dixon line, geographically situated on the border between Pennsylvania, a somewhat free state, and Maryland, a slave state. The abolition of slavery in Pennsylvania occurred incrementally. 
in fits and starts beginning in 1780. By 1830, pro-slavery advocates and anti-slavery activists were competing in the press, in debate halls, and occasionally in the streets. That year, Catherine Linhart McPherson gave birth to her son, whom she named Edward. As he grew up, Edward was exposed to two primary influences. First, his father's work at the bank, which not only secured the family's finances, but also secured Edward with discussions of investments, loans, repayments, and capital. Through example, environment, and education, Edward developed an innate business sense from an early age. Importantly, one of these family investments was a small farm just west of town, along the Chambersburg Pike. Second, Edward was influenced by debates about freedom and slavery, which periodically dominated town politics. Edward, sometimes called Little Nettie, grew up in a town with both southern slave catchers and free black residents, abolitionists and agrarians, the Underground Railroad, and indentured servitude. Anti-slavery societies met at nearby two taverns and hosted speakers including Jonathan Blanchard, who spoke in front of the Adams County Courthouse. On its steps, he declared the immorality of slavery. Town residents responded to these meetings and Blanchard's speeches by assaulting him with rotten eggs, stones, and even a dead cat. Among their number were citizens who argued that abolition would be more destructive than helpful, and that ending the practice risked dissolving the Union of States. One wonders if little Nettie, only a few years old, wandered to see what the town commotion was, or if the event was discussed around the McPherson dinner table. Word of the treatment of Blanchard certainly reached one man, who had practiced law in Gettysburg for years, and was already on track for a rapid rise in political fortune, Thaddeus Stevens, who returned to Gettysburg to do one of the things he did best, yell at people. Roaring at the citizens of Gettysburg, Stevens raged, A man comes to speak for universal liberty? Him you answer with violence and rotten eggs? Shame! 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 What free man does not feel himself covered all over with burning blushes to find himself surrounded by such free men? Edward was exposed to one of the central political issues of the time on all sides, from his slave-owning grandparents to his father's friend Thad, a rabid abolitionist. His political education began on the conflicted streets of Gettysburg before he ever entered a classroom. Of course, Edward was well-educated, studying in the public schools of the town and destined for Pennsylvania College, a school for which both Thaddeus Stevens and Edward's father John were original trustees. Leveraging his wealth and employment at the Bank of Gettysburg, John helped negotiate the newborn college's debts and served on a handful of committees. Edward enrolled in the school in 1845 to little fanfare. As historian Evan Rothera noted, McPherson was an average student, though he was strong in such subjects as history. His report cards, now stored at the Library of Congress, show that Edward scored perfectly in his history class with good conduct grades, except for his first semester, when he was docked for being absent at ball games too often on Wednesday afternoons. Beyond just skipping class for ball, Edward formed a Shakespeare club, where performances of Hamlet and the Tempest taught him to be comfortable in front of a crowd. His most important extracurricular, though, was the Debate Society. A member of the Phrenicosmian Society on campus, Edward routinely debated members of the rival Philomathian Society. The societies, according to historian Anna Jane Moyer, aimed to encourage practice in oratory and composition, ease and freedom in extemporaneous speaking, as well as broaden the range of thought and culture on campus while cultivating a taste for learning and the sentiment of friendship. Preserved in Musselman Library's special collections, Nettie's class notebook contains a few of his handwritten speeches lovingly transcribed in the back pages. It provides a glimpse not only of McPherson's penmanship, but also an early example of his political consciousness. Delivered in 1848 at the nearby Christ Lutheran Church, Edward rose in front of the assembled crowd and debated the question, if new slave territory be annexed to the Union, should it be dissolved? Such a question was not just theoretical, but was forefront on the nation's mind. Three years earlier, Florida and Texas were admitted to the Union both as slave states. These admissions increased the size of the United States significantly and strengthened pro-slavery factions within the United States government. In response, anti-slavery groups like the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society advocated for dissolving the Union of States, declaring, Let our efforts be especially directed till slavery shall be abolished or the league which now binds us to that vile and execrable institution and unites our destinies in peace and in war with the destinies of the guilty slave master shall be finally broken. Thus, when Edward McPherson stood to speak on that spring day, he defined his position on one of the key issues 
facing the United States in the pre-war period. So for the United States, disunion becomes an increasing part of the abolitionist discourse, including some African Americans who think that disunion is the way to go, but they're much fewer. So for, for instance, one of the big debates, more into the 1850s, but it's starting in the 1840s between Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, is about disunion because Garrison gets to the point where he advocates disunion. Uh, Douglas and most African Americans think, feel you can't abandon our black brothers and sisters in the South and that disunion is not gonna help them. McPherson's speech was a resounding no to the idea of dissolving the Union. He began by digging at his opponent, saying, To the many personalities with which my opponent has spiced his speech, I will make no reply as I consider the time unfit, the place unfit, and the conduct unbecoming of anyone who lays claim to gentility. His central argument rested on a few key points, beginning with the claim that dissolution of the Union would not lend in the least degree to the abolition of slavery. Edward argued that instead, the Union was necessary for speeding up the South's realization of slavery's immorality. The South is beginning to consider slavery in the proper light. Were the Union to dissolve this community of interest, you destroy the responsibility resting upon the South to remove every cause which is retarding her onward progress. There were many others, a lot of black abolitionists and white abolitionists, who thought the South will not give it up. Uh, white slaveholders and other enslavers are not going to give up slavery, as well as all the people who were not holding slaves but who benefited from it. And I think the economic data supports that. As we know, slavery actually economically was doing quite well on the eve of the Civil War, contrary to the old historiographical argument that well, slavery was dying on the vine and the war wasn't really necessary, so thus it was a war of Northern aggression. But we know the data doesn't support that. The empirical evidence says slavery was growing. The richest county in the country was Adams County, Mississippi in 1860. So what's their incentive to give it up? Edward pulled from a deep historical knowledge to argue that disunion would ruin the great American experiment of democracy. He cited politicians like Daniel Webster and George Washington to emphasize American prosperity. Our resources have so increased that we may with safety defy the power and ambition of the whole world. Our name and our nation, our political and social institutions, have become the objects of respect among all the nations. Edward was deeply opposed to putting these things at risk. Chief among them, the personal liberty of the citizen, that liberty which has been the prize contended for by so many people in so many ages through the strife and blood of so many revolutions. To protect this liberty and freedom, Edward argued, the Union had to be preserved. It's important to note that while Edward emphasized the liberty the Union provided, he downplayed the fact that such freedom was denied wholly to the enslaved and partially to free African Americans across the Union though he did claim that the evils of slavery would eventually be destroyed. After 35 minutes of speaking, he concluded with a quote from Daniel Webster. Liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. Edward's debate speech shows the early stage of his political principles, the deep regard he held for the United States as a corporate body, and his dedication to union before abolition. It also displays how Gettysburg provided McPherson with a place to develop his skills as an orator and debater. It was one of the earliest of countless arguments to his hometown he would deliver in speeches, pamphlets, and debates. McPherson went on to graduate as valedictorian in 1848 and moved to Lancaster to study law with Thaddeus Stevens at the encouragement of his father. This family connection not only provided McPherson with a job, but solidified Stevens as Edward's lifelong mentor, partner, and friend. This initial partnership, however, failed to live up to anyone's expectations. Though McPherson certainly grew as a lawyer, he quit shortly after beginning, citing issues with his health. Despite its brevity, this experience with Stevens allowed Edward to see the lawyer's challenges to the Fugitive Slave Act, fighting for the right of enslaved people to escape bondage without being returned to those who claimed to own them. When Edward left Gettysburg to join Stevens, he went from debating the idea of slavery to witnessing the legal apparatuses which made the system operate. McPherson's experience likely elevated the issue within his mind, though certainly not over the principle of union. A glimmer of his political feelings could be heard in Stevens' declaration. I thus announce my unchangeable hostility to slavery in every form, and in every place. I also avow my determination to stand by all the compromises of the Constitution. McPherson left for Harrisburg and took up journalism, allowing him to write about politics and history while apparently being better for his overall health. 
He worked as a correspondent for a time before receiving a letter from his friend Thaddeus, who was starting a new newspaper. I now write to see whether it would suit your view to become the editor. We propose the following terms. You would be the editor with an assistant to take the drudgery off your hands. You to write the original matter and have the general editorial control. Please answer as fast as convenient. Thaddeus Stevens. McPherson accepted the job and quickly began publishing in the interest of the Whig Party. During McPherson's time as a journalist, the issues facing the United States seemed only to grow. Writing as a Whig, McPherson was devoted to promoting national unity and believed that the government should promote economic development. Further, McPherson and Stevens used the newspaper to advocate against the institution of slavery, though it appears likely that Stevens' contributions were stronger at this time than McPherson's. Their newspaper, The Independent Whig, was slammed by opposing pro-slavery papers. One went as far as to say that the most active friends of the new paper throughout the country are violent abolitionists. However, the Whig party was fracturing, primarily over the issue of slavery. Following the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the party began a death spiral. Party membership included both Abraham Lincoln and future Vice President of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens. Obviously, no compromise could keep the political unit from fracturing. New parties were emerging from the ashes of the collapsing Whigs, though. The first was the American Party, better known as the Know-Nothings. The party was opposed to equal rights and instead argued that groups are entitled to such privileges, social and political, as they are capable of employing and enjoying rationally. The party was firmly opposed to immigration, women's rights, and religious diversity. The Know-Nothings were very popular in Southern Pennsylvania, and Thaddeus Stevens briefly flirted with the party, hoping to capitalize on anti-slavery feelings among the Know-Nothing nativists. This lasted only a short time when Stevens, McPherson, and other anti-slavery Whigs found a new party with which to align. The Republican Party arose following slavery's expansion in the Kansas-Nebraska Acts and the events of Bloody Kansas in the 1850s. The party platform explicitly opposed the extension of slavery into new American states and territories, though it didn't advocate for the abolition of slavery in states where it currently existed. The party's rising star, ex-Whig Abraham Lincoln, fiercely denied the morality of slavery and connected his condemnation of the institution with appeals to the nation's founding principles. He also recognized that despite his opposition to the peculiar institution, he would privilege preserving the Union over ending the practice. McPherson's personal views at this time were especially similar, complemented by progressive Whig business values he would retain for the rest of his life. In an 1857 speech delivered in Gettysburg, McPherson elucidated his emerging political philosophy. The growth of individualism, as the speech was called, emphasized that liberty and equality before the law separated the United States from the tyrannical governments of the past. The equality of all before the law is the grandest idea in the government and is the necessary corollary of that comforting truth of religion, the equality of all before God. This grand idea, however, was being dismantled by an issue McPherson addressed head on, slavery. In his eyes, the debate about slavery fracturing both the nation and the Whigs was not rooted in constitutionality. The Constitution is not a slavery establishing or slavery extending instrument. It was framed in an enlarged spirit of liberty and was intended to confer the blessings of liberty, not the curses of slavery. They have, however, so far modified the natural rights of portions of residents of this country as to make it necessary to say that when we proceed to speak of the guarantees our laws give to individual liberty, the remarks must always be considered as having exclusive reference to the unmixed white race alone. So I, th I think that's an interesting perspective that he takes because if McPherson was arguing that was actually neutral, I, I wouldn't agree with that. I don't think it's neutral, although I can certainly see how it could be interpreted either way. It could be interpreted as pro-slavery. It could be interpreted as Douglas's more optimistic formulation that it's anti-slavery because it could be used for either. You know, it could be depending on how you're going to interpret it. It could be used for either. So I'm not neutral sounds like the Constitution had nothing to say about it, which it does. For Edward, the single greatest obstacle to American liberty was not the questions of states' rights, manifest destiny, or economic development. It is the existence of human slavery, the antipode of that individualism for which we plead, which alone detracts from the sublimity of our institutions. By 1858, the Whigs had broken apart. Edward had achieved a high level of political intelligence, and American slavery had hit a crisis point. 
With the encouragement of Thaddeus Stevens, McPherson entered the political arena. From his home in Gettysburg, Edward established a campaign to represent the 17th Congressional District of Pennsylvania in the United States House. In August, he published a pamphlet outlining his views and reasons for running. Edward began with economic concerns. Showing his Whig roots, he argued that government promotion of American business would aid in vitalizing the energies of the nation, making the world our tributary instead of us being the world's, and largely increasing the wealth, prosperity, and power of the whole people. McPherson also used this plank to reinforce the importance of free labor, both as an antithesis to slavery and as a core part of American development. The free labor of the country needs, deserves, and must have protection. Whoever would refuse to give it is neither wise nor just, neither liberal nor patriotic. McPherson subsequently addressed the issue of slavery, though in a very political manner. As the pro-slavery factions in Adams County as a whole were stronger than just inside the borough of Gettysburg, McPherson didn't speak to slavery itself. Instead, McPherson used the future of Kansas, then embroiled in a guerrilla war about whether it would be a free or slave state, to subtly imply his views on the broader issue. A recent state constitution preserving slavery was voted down by the majority of Kansans, yet then-President Buchanan continued to push for its adoption. To McPherson, this was probably the most flagrant violation of the fundamental principles of American liberty known to our history. Using the language of the debate to not only strengthen his argument, but to signal his principles, he boldly claimed, To deny the sovereignty of the people over their domestic affairs was constituting Congress a despot and the people its slaves. This is one of the last times McPherson hid his principles within the subtext of his speeches. Within only a few years, McPherson would stand with remarkable courage to proudly proclaim his beliefs, even when it cost him greatly. McPherson's pamphlet ended with an age-old complaint about federal spending and, along with a number of other pamphlets, was noted for displaying his intellect and education. The Adams County Sentinel, the local Republican paper, bragged, We have in our midst a young and talented man who we think is just the man. He has, by his able pen, made himself a reputation throughout the state which few men of his age possess. Another bragged that he was a well-educated and accomplished editor of 10 years hard application and well-versed in political science, a comment sure to please his former professors at Pennsylvania College. Despite McPherson's pamphlet series and public parades, opponents attacked him as inexperienced, someone who ran away from Gettysburg to Lancaster, someone too wealthy to understand the common man. The Fulton Democrat went so far as to say, He is a dandified chap with an overwhelming amount of vanity. In the end, these attacks weren't enough. McPherson won his seat with a slim margin of around 250 votes. His family congratulated him on his victory, and he joined 112 other Republicans in joining the House, giving the newborn party a plurality for the first time. I would imagine when he went to D.C. that that would have been a different kind of experience, because slavery is still legal there. Mm -hmm. And so, and you have a significant free black community and a significant enslaved community, and the population is much bigger. It was probably more unavoidable. It doesn't sound like he was trying to avoid the issue beforehand, but my my inclination would be to think that once he's in D.C., uh, he's very much in the thick of it in ways that probably he had not experienced when he was in Gettysburg. Right. Meanwhile, the Know Nothing Party had begun to collapse over the issue of slavery. Likewise, slavery caused divisions within the Democratic Party. As anti-slavery Democrats joined the Republicans, and those who remained failed to agree on the issue. Though immigration, the economy, and railroad infrastructure also played into the election, it was clear that slavery was the key issue of the period. McPherson's first term as a representative was surprisingly uneventful, though not uncommon for a first-time rep. He came back to Gettysburg often, giving speeches on politics, Christianity, and the role of family, and was regarded as an effective speaker. When he ran for re-election in 1860, he was re-elected by an even larger margin than before. But 1860 was a tumultuous year for American politics, marking the election of Abraham Lincoln in a presidential race split between four candidates. Though the multi-party election cost the Republicans a few seats, secession's arrival in the coming months would ensure Republican control of the House. Just over a month after the November election, secession conventions had begun to meet as southern states considered whether or not they would leave the Union. McPherson, who had always been fundamentally committed to the American Union, was enraged. On December 20, 1860, South Carolina officially seceded from the United States. 
By the end of January, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana had also left. Edward McPherson's life had thus far been dedicated to the preservation of the Union, and all of his writings, from his student debates in Gettysburg to his political pamphlets, had emphasized the value, importance, and necessity of the American experiment. Thus, when the Union began to disintegrate in January 1861, McPherson's anger was immense. This unbridled rage led to a disgusted, impassioned speech which would go down as the best oration of McPherson's entire life. Speaking on the floor of the House on January 23rd, as state after state seceded, McPherson roared against the disunion conspiracy. In no uncertain terms, he described how the rebellious states were despicable. A conspiracy so wide, complete and extensive, never before threatened the overthrow of the national constitution and the destruction of human hopes and rights. Today it stands before the American people, the most hideous development in their history or that of any other nation. He recognized, like all other politicians of the time, that the root issue was slavery, spitting. On all questions affecting slavery, they treat the Constitution with violence, stretching it far beyond its letter or spirit. Every step in this treasonable movement betrays the conscious guilt of its participants. He engaged in a legalistic takedown of Southern secession, citing legal treatises, revolutionary parliamentary systems, the words of the American founders, and tariff policy to slam home the point that secession flew in the face of American democracy and the United States Constitution. It was both a legal and a moral crime to McPherson. It would destroy American unity, which is one of the greatest facts of history, thus committing a crime against humanity. All races feel this yearning for union, and many have strugglingly, and for years vainly, sought it. For McPherson, a principled Unionist and Christian, the secessionists were destined to fail, as foretold by both history and divinity. I have heard it lately said that there are three things that were necessary in governmental construction. Wise men, money, and the favor of God. If this be true, the Southern movement must have disastrous termination. Edward's speech climaxed with an impassioned warning that secession would fail, though not immediately, as long as Americans fought for their republic. It contains within itself the causes of inevitable failure. It ought to fail. It will fail. Mankind cannot afford its success. The American people will not allow it. God, I speak it with reverence, will not permit the sacrilegious overthrow. Every instinct revolts at it. Every principle rebels against it. Every interest cries aloud in earnest protest. States may reel and fall. Communities may forget their duties. Majorities may be misled. Citizens may neglect their trust. Folly, terrorism, and treason may rule the hour, but the storm will pass, the calm come, and peace be again within our borders. It may not be very soon. The virus is not thus easily expelled from the body politic. Blows are not so soon forgotten. Gashes do not at once heal up, and when they do, scars are left. But this much is certain. The Union will not be destroyed. You ask what will save it. I answer that ever-living, ever-thinking mass. The people will save it. Concluding his speech, McPherson made two promises to the assembled congressmen and the American public. First, Whatever can be fairly asked of me, I am ready to do, as my votes will show. Finally willing to spend the political capital he had earned, McPherson announced he was prepared to do whatever he needed to do to save the Union, a commitment that would soon be tested. Second, that if violence were to come, the Union would fight back and it would win. If, in dire infatuation, all honorable adjustment be spurned, all peaceful accommodation be refused, then will have arrived the time to test the strength of the government. Sir, I both dread and reprobate collision. But if, to maintain this government against vile conspiracy, and save ourselves from anarchy and the Republican system from contempt, if to protect our property from spoliation and our flag from dishonor, if to keep from the page of history the scornful sentence, free institutions are a failure, collision must come, let it come, and upon the aggressors rest the responsibility. Edward McPherson sat down after declaring all this and prepared for the storm he saw on the horizon. Only three months later, the southern states opened fire on Fort Sumter, and the conspiracy he had warned about became a confederacy.
As the United States went to war in the summer of 1861, McPherson set out to ensure his hometown would support the fight which he warned was on the horizon. Pulling on his connections as a member of the local community, and with an influential family name behind him, McPherson helped enlist dozens of men into Company K of the 1st Pennsylvania Reserves. Over half of them were under 21 years old, and they would go on to serve in eight major battles. McPherson became captain of the company, which mustered into service near Baltimore on July 26th. For just under a month, McPherson served as an aide to General John Adams Dix. In August, he had to resign in order to serve his session in Congress. Though he would never fight in a military battle, Edward did his duty to raise troops who could. His fights would take place on the floor of the House. True to his word, McPherson pledged his political platform to fight secession and save the Union. Republicans passed legislation expanding American railroads to better move troops and supplies, established the IRS and the income tax, critical to funding the war against slavery and keeping American soldiers from starvation, and required that African Americans be allowed to serve in state militias. In 1861 and 62, Congress passed Confiscation Acts, allowing for the seizure of Confederate property, which included enslaved African Americans. Banning the return of fugitive slaves and providing the U.S. Army with authorization to free enslaved people as they marched through the South, the bill advanced black freedom despite myriad legal complications. All slaves shall be forever free of their servitude and not again held as slaves. The Confiscation Acts paved the way for a revolutionary next step by President Lincoln, which he proposed on September 22, 1862. That on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1,863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforth, and forever free. In the North, free blacks like Frederick Douglass celebrated when emancipation was enacted on January 1st, 1863. The scene was wild and grand. Joy and gladness exhausted all the forms of expression, from shouts of praise to joys and tears. In the South, slave owners concealed the information from the humans they enslaved, and Jefferson Davis railed against the decision. Several millions of human beings of an inferior race, peaceful and contented laborers in their sphere, are doomed to extermination, while at the same time they are encouraged to a general assassination of their masters. But long before the act was even put into place, Adams County revolted against it. Ed McPherson's electoral career is really fascinating. He swept into office with Abraham Lincoln. And as a result, he lives and dies by Lincoln's actions. Because the entire Republican Party at that point in time, it's so new. It's so nascent. It has so many cracks and crevices. And it's a fusion party. And as a result, it's really fragile. And Ed McPherson is sitting on one of the cracks. And then 1862 happens. And in 1862, in the fall of 1862, Lincoln gets the excuse to do precisely what he's wanted to for about a year at that point. He gets the excuse to issue the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. And with that one moment, he transforms the war. And here in Adams County, all the Democrats balk. The Democratic paper, the compiler, true to their name, compiled numerous objections to the proclamation, including statements that We implore the conservative men of the nation to present a united front to that flood tide of fanaticism and disregard of the constitutional rights of American citizens, which this proclamation of the president will pour over the land. Taking experience as our guide, we can see nothing resulting from this proclamation but evil to our cause. Local resistance to emancipation highlighted how Northerners who supported the war as a means to save the Union did not necessarily also support efforts to bring about racial equality. McPherson's votes, which he promised to use to save the Union, now brought him under the crosshairs of his community. And here in the local press, as you start digging through the newspapers, you start seeing immediately, as that document comes up, immediately on its issue, the local press, particularly Henry Staley, grab it. They roll it up and they beat Ed McPherson around the head with it. The compiler decried McPherson. Remember that Edward McPherson voted with the abolitionists for the confiscation bill, in pursuance of which President Lincoln has declared his purpose to liberate the Negroes of the South. 
To make matters worse, redistricting had turned McPherson's congressional district into one far less disposed to abolition than it had been in 1858. Politics definitely by the time, uh, by midway through the war, had turned and the Democrats have control of this area locally. McPherson had remained true to his word, voting to advance the Union war effort and to advance the issue of racial equality. But in November 1862, he paid the price for it. McPherson was defeated in a landslide. The political career he had worked toward his entire life was over. Of course, McPherson was not plagued by boredom in the wake of the lost election. He had remained busy outside of Congress in the past four years. Having voted to create the Internal Revenue Service, he took up a post as its deputy commissioner. Most importantly, he had fallen in love with the daughter of a powerful Gettysburg lawyer. Annie Dodds Crawford took Edward McPherson to be her husband in their hometown of Gettysburg on November 12, 1862. At the same time that Edward lost his seat in Congress, he gained a partner who would stay by his side for the rest of his life. Edward and Annie lived in D.C. as Edward completed his term in the House. He quickly acquired an appointment as the Deputy Commissioner of Internal Revenue, spent time with Annie, and managed some keen entrepreneurial investments. One of these tied McPherson to family, home, and Gettysburg. A large farm west of Gettysburg on the Chambersburg Pike had been purchased by his father John in the 1840s. When he passed away during Edward's first campaign for the house, Edward inherited it amongst a host of other assets. Edward, of course, couldn't both run the farm and serve in Congress, so he hired a tenant farmer, John Slintz, to farm the land. Slintz managed a comfortable lifestyle and was especially proud of his home's carpeting, the family Bible, and silk dresses for his girls. So it was that on July 1st, 1863, it was not Edward McPherson in the farm on what is now known as McPherson's Ridge. He was in Washington, D.C., implementing economic policy, listening to the sounds of carriages in the street, and celebrating his wife's recent pregnancy as reports filtered in of a brewing engagement in South Central Pennsylvania. Instead, it was John Slintz who heard cannon booming on ridges to the west as Confederate and Union skirmishers initiated the battle. Evacuated by Union soldiers on horseback, Slintz and his family dashed across the terrain to the nearby seminary, where they hid in terror as shot and shell screamed through the sky. As Slintz held his wife and children close in the seminary basement, the farm he had tended to for years became the battleground of John Buford's cavalry, who used each ridge in a series of delaying tactics, hoping against hope that Union reinforcements would arrive in time. To the south, in what is now known as either McPherson's Woods or Herbst's Woods, Union General John Reynolds was shot through the neck, dying almost instantly. The delaying tactics gave the Union Army a fighting chance, but they weren't enough to win the first day of battle. Union soldiers took cover near the stone walls of the McPherson barn, harassed by Confederate artillery and sharpshooters. Eventually, they were forced to retreat to Oak Ridge before fleeing through the cramped streets of the town. Confederate soldiers took control of the McPherson farm and the ridges around town, and the stage for the second day of battle was set. While Slintz comforted his young children in a dark basement, Confederate and Union wounded alike sought refuge in the McPherson barn. A Georgian soldier described the scene. This farmhouse was the scene of one of the bloodiest battles of the war. Taken and retaken, riddled by bullets, filled with the dead and dying, the very cows and horses shot down by stray bullets, and yet not materially damaged. I found it filled with the Federal dead and wounded. Positions for both armies were in attendance. It fell to the lot of a little calf to speak more eloquently than all the rest of the war's sacrifices. The mother of the little dumb beast was killed by a stray shot during the day. Evidently a pet of the household, it wandered around the whole of the night, bleeding and moaning piteously for its dame. As morning came, the dying continued to fill McPherson's barns with groans and cries of mortal pain. The calf continued to wander the blood-soaked earth, looking in vain for its eviscerated mother. Slints hummed softly to his four-year-old daughter, Sarah, Yet on the other side of town, McPherson's political work was yet again brought to bear in the fight for union and emancipation, transpiring in the town where the seeds of his life's work had been planted in his youth. Marching back to their hometown on the morning of July 2nd, McPherson's own Company K of the 1st Pennsylvania Reserves was sent to fill in gaps in the union line caused by General Daniel Sickles. The terrain felt familiar under their feet. Many of them had farmed, explored, or ridden these lands as children, before being called to the service as teenagers. Many could see their homes from the hills. One soldier remembered, We had gone out two years before to conquer the enemy on his own soil, 
but we're now returning after two years of struggle to meet him face to face at our own door. When the Confederates fought to wrest control of Little Round Top from the Union Army, Company K aided in their repulse, enduring the horrors of the Valley of Death, Plum Run, and the infamous Wheatfield. They were able to hold the line, but the regiment suffered 46 casualties. After fighting even more on July 3rd, many of Gettysburg's boys snuck home to visit their families during the night. Henry Minnick, a local school teacher and father serving in Company K, wrote, All retired to their comfortable beds, of which they had been deprived for two nights and I had not enjoyed for two years. When the Slunt's family returned to their home, however, they were not greeted by any modicum of comfort. The house, barn, and fields had been converted into a terrible hospital and makeshift graveyard. A local man, William McLean, had come to bring raspberries from his garden to the wounded soldiers. There was parties engaged in burying the dead in the fields where they fell. A dead soldier in blue was lying along the side of the turnpike, black and swollen from the heat and rain, disfigured beyond recognition. When I entered the barn, it was crowded with the wounded of both armies, some of them having fallen four days before and without having any food. Minister Leonard Gardner also witnessed the horror of the McPherson farm. In the retreat during the night, these men, who had been in the hands of the enemy for three days, were left behind. I was asked to assist in holding the limbs of the subject operated on. The heat was intense, and as the men had received no treatment for three days, the odor of the wounds was repulsive. One after another was put under the influence of chloroform, and while the surgeon dexterously performed the operation, I would hold the limb until it was separated from the body. As the soldiers lost their limbs and their lives, the Slint's family quickly realized they had lost their livelihoods. Their animals were killed by gunfire and artillery or hobbled on broken legs. Their fields had been trampled by armies of men. The hay from the barn had been used to sop up blood. Their food was eaten. One of the family's precious quilts was wrapped around a dead soldier who was buried with others in the garden. The Slintses were forced to live at the seminary for three months while over 200 soldiers convalesced in their home and barn. Edward McPherson visited a week after the battle's close, finding the town painted with the dead and the dying, his land holdings destroyed, and yet his nation having won two great victories, one in his hometown in the east and the other in Vicksburg in the west. Both men filed damage claims to help recoup their losses, though much of the damage was still left unclaimed. Repairs were made with funds from both men, but eventually Slentz moved away and McPherson sold the home, hoping to recoup his losses. Though McPherson was not in Gettysburg during the Great Battle, his presence was acutely felt by the Slentz family, whose tenant farm was destroyed, by the Union soldiers, who prayed their final prayers and slipped into death under the wooden roof of McPherson's barn, and by the company of brave soldiers who faced death to save their hometown from invasion. Though he never saw battle, McPherson received an honorary captain's sword for his work in mustering the company of Adams Countyans. The stone barn, the only remaining wartime structure on his farm, remains as one of the signature features of the historic landscape, looming over the site of some of the earliest and bloodiest clashes of the battle. Its walls even bear the markings of returning Pennsylvanian veterans who scratched their names into the place they sought shelter during the fierce fighting. McPherson's Ridge serves as a silent sentinel and witness to the contest over and the ultimate fruition of Edward McPherson's political ideals. McPherson quickly returned to Washington, where Annie gave birth to their first child, John, in October. Though he continued to work at the IRS in D.C., he also continued to weave his way into the political machinations of his longtime mentor, friend, and fellow Gettysburg community member, Thaddeus Stevens. As the year drew to a close, the two concocted a mutually beneficial situation. Stevens could corral enough votes to make McPherson clerk of the House of Representatives, a position lacking in glamour, but strong in influence. McPherson could once again help shape the future of the nation, so long as he helped Stevens push radical legislation through the Republican-controlled legislature. This, of course, only sweetened the pot for Edward, who found in Stevens a political role model even more opposed to the institution of slavery than he was. On December 6th, 1863, McPherson took up the gavel of the house, a position he would come to hold often for the rest of his life. Throughout the next two years of war, McPherson dutifully served his nation, his party, and his friend. 
Ever committed to the preservation of the country he loved, McPherson was keen to document the occurrences of the Congress, meeting both a professional responsibility and a personal passion. His indexes, handbooks, and leaflets provide valuable, if intensely dry, political histories of the period, organized with the doggedness of a journalist and the tediousness of a lawyer. During this time, Congress established fighting regiments of black soldiers in the war against slavery, oversaw a peaceful election in 1864, and continued to fund the war effort. But no act of the House was more important than the passage of the 13th Amendment on January 31, 1865. The amendment, which abolished legal slavery in the United States except for incarcerated prisoners, traced its origins back to the Confiscation Act, which McPherson had voted for, despite opposition from his hometown in Adams County, and the Emancipation Proclamation, which had cost McPherson his seat, but won the freedom of millions of enslaved Americans. Edward's mentor, Thaddeus Stevens, as well as Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner, had spearheaded the effort and McPherson had literally been front and center to the months of debate and failed votes that led up to one cold winter morning with the amendment on the verge of collapse. When the vote was finally held, it was the voice of Edward McPherson, Gettysburg resident and Pennsylvania College alumnus, who called the names of every representative to record their vote in the annals of American history. As the names were called, it appeared that the vote wouldn't pass, the air of the chamber perhaps more tense than at any other time in American history. In the pivotal moment, McPherson called the names of 14 Democrats who jumped ship and voted the amendment into passage, a moment depicted in the Oscar-winning film Lincoln. The work of abolitionists across the nation, from Harriet Beecher Stowe to Frederick Douglass to Edward McPherson, had finally paid off. Republican Congressman George Julian wrote, Members joined in the shouting and kept it up for some minutes. Some embraced one another, others wept like children. No doubt, Edward was among the cheering mass. Two months later, in March, Edward McPherson called the roll for a vote on establishing the Freedmen's Bureau, a department dedicated to providing care for formerly enslaved people. The act must have brought a smile to McPherson's face, as finally he saw his precious government working on behalf of the people to secure liberty for Americans of all races. The speech he had given in Gettysburg just seven years before was, again, highly prescient. If that act made McPherson smile, he must have shouted with glee when, on April 9th, Robert E. Lee surrendered to Union General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. The war, broadly speaking, was over. McPherson's union had won, his anti-slavery work had paid off, and now he, Stevens, and other radical Republicans were on the verge of transforming the South with progressive legislation. Only five days later, the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, was shot and killed at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. The man who had led Edward's party to power, who had epitomized his moral opposition to slavery and his eternal dedication to the American Union, bled to death in a small bed. The next morning, Lincoln's vice president, Andrew Johnson, took the oath of office. Johnson had originally been a Democratic senator, but remained loyal to the Union when secession began in 1861. He was a staunch Unionist, like McPherson, but quickly revealed an unwillingness to impose significant punishments on the South as they made their way back into the United States. Johnson's plans, according to historian Bruce Levine, were presented as being identical to the Reconstruction plans of Lincoln. This could only be true, however, if Lincoln's political and personal views had stopped evolving in April of 1861. Rather, Lincoln had grown increasingly committed to advancing and securing the rights of Black Americans as the war went on. McPherson had undergone a similar transition, maturing from the grandson of wealthy slave owners into an outright abolitionist. His youth spent in Gettysburg, a town on the border of slavery and freedom, and his mentorship under Thaddeus Stevens made the adult McPherson an opponent of Johnson's extremely relaxed responses to former Confederates seeking to return to the Union as if the war had been of little importance. Frederick Douglass stated the issue plainly after seeing Johnson. Whatever Andrew Johnson may be, he is no friend of our race. Republicans immediately clashed with Andrew Johnson, not surprisingly led by Thaddeus Stevens. Key to their disagreement were frustrations about the restoration of rebellious states back into the Union. For radical Republicans like Stevens and McPherson, the power lay in Congress, which was unwilling to restore political rights to Confederates until they showed they would not obstruct the human rights of Black men, women, and children in the South. 
Johnson, on the other hand, sought the reintegration of ex-Confederate politicians and elites, regardless of the consequences for Black Americans. Acting without the approval of Congress, Johnson worked to return the planter class to power in the South, where they rapidly established Black codes, systems of law that recreated the status of slavery in everything but name, and impoverished millions of Black citizens. These battles came to a head in December of 1865, when Congress reconvened for the first time with representatives from Tennessee, Virginia, and Louisiana. Radical Republicans faced a dilemma. By allowing the ex-Confederate representatives and senators back into the body, political control would shift to an alliance of white Southerners and Democrats, who Stevens feared would guarantee the oppression of the freedmen and the re-establishment of slavery. After years of hard-won victories, unpopular campaigns to eradicate slavery, and the death of their beloved leader, everything they worked for was teetering on the edge. Finally, a single, unconventional option presented itself. A way to prevent ex-Confederates from taking control of Congress and establishing black codes at the federal level, or worse, revoking the 13th Amendment. So these were the stakes when the Southern elect representatives showed up on December 4th, 1865. But Thaddeus Stevens was not going to let this happen. And he had come up with a plan that involved Edward McPherson in the Republican caucus at that time. So the moment that we're talking about now is this amazing instance in American history where a stupid rule is leveraged for a moral reason. And Stevens, knowing the rules, Ferson, knowing the rules, cook up a plan. And the plan is simple and diabolical and just beautiful in its execution. And this plan relied entirely on the shoulders of one man, Edward McPherson. On December 4th, 1865, Edward McPherson took up his position at the head of the House of Representatives and began to call the name of each elected rep. As the name was called, McPherson presented the individual's credentials and received a response from the representative affirming they were in attendance. By confirming their attendance, the representative was officially recognized as part of the 39th Congress of the United States of America and eligible to be sworn in. McPherson, as he had for some of the most important votes in American history before, dutifully read name after name, welcoming new members to Congress, until he arrived at the name of a member from an ex-Confederate state. Each time he came across one of these names, he single-handedly prevented them from immediate entrance into the Congress, using an option available to only him out of the entire nation. He simply skipped their name. Edward McPherson starts to call the roll call for the new Congress. And he gets to the Southern names and he skips them, doesn't call them out. By skipping their name, McPherson refused the ex-Confederates entrance into one of the most powerful chambers in the United States. What's more, the unnamed men couldn't protest the decision, as to overturn an action of the clerk of the House, the majority of sworn-in members had to vote. Because the men were never sworn in, they could never register an official complaint that they had been skipped on the roll. If we refuse to call the names of former Confederates, who are now to be seated here in the halls of Congress, we can keep them from speaking on the floor. And, What's insidious about that, what's beautifully insidious is that we can keep them from speaking on the floor, which means that they cannot raise objection to the fact that their name wasn't called because they were, their name wasn't called, right? It's this catch-22 moment that Stevens and McPherson start to cook up. When Horace Maynard from Tennessee indicated that he would challenge the decision, McPherson simply skipped his name as well. When Maynard begged Stevens to yield time to him in order to register a complaint, Stevens growled in response. I cannot yield to any gentleman who does not belong to this body, who is an outsider. And the Southerners go apoplectic on the floor. They are incensed and they start screaming. And then other folks start pointing out, you have no right to scream here, right? And it, it just feeds into this beast and underscores the point that loyalty should mean something that loyalty to the United States during the war that tried to destroy the United States over an institution as asinine and immoral as slavery, that loyalty should matter. Congressional Republicans retained control over Congress, though power shifted from the radical wing to the more moderate one. They continued to battle against President Johnson, but successfully managed to pass not only a major civil rights bill, 
but also the 14th Amendment, which provided equal protection to American citizens, regardless of race, under the law, and would be the basis for landmark discrimination cases like Brown v. Board, Roe v. Wade, and Oberfell v. Hodges. McPherson understood the risk of what he was doing. If someone challenged what he had done, it could result in his removal as House clerk or the further alienation of moderates within the Republican Party. Refusal to even speak the names of former Confederates may well have made Edward fearful of assassination, which had claimed his president not long before. And yet, when McPherson stood at that perilous moment, with the fates and futures of millions of Americans on the line, he acted decisively and secured legislation that would not only partially protect the civil rights of countless of his fellow citizens, but also established legal precedent to guarantee liberty and freedom for centuries to come. This is a moment where he shines. And like all of his predecessors, right, like all of those mentors he's had, like Thaddeus Stevens, like Abraham Lincolns, he realizes that I've got political capital in my pocket. I've got a cudgel of power that I can wield. And I'm going to wield it, damn it, for the right reason. McPherson was not the single mind behind the 14th Amendment, nor was he primarily responsible for the civil rights advances that came as a result of its passage. But... In one of the most perilous moments of McPherson's political career, he acted fearlessly to preserve the promises of the nation he loved so much. It just strikes me that no one else could do what he did and that the courage that in those moments, um, maybe it was excitement too, but the courage to do that really strikes me in that sense of there's always some way in which we might be gatekeepers in big or small ways and that here he was, he was the only one who could do that. And he did the thing that only he could do. From his perch at the head of the House of Representatives, McPherson would continue to serve as clerk through the rise and fall of Reconstruction, while adding even more things to his plate. First, a growing family. By 1874, Annie and Edward had welcomed William Linhart, Norman Crawford, Donald Paxton, and Anna Dunlop into their family. As their children grew, Annie found Washington, D.C. to be suffocating and far from family, so Edward built a beautiful home on Carlisle Street in their hometown of Gettysburg. All five of the children grew up next to Pennsylvania College in a beautiful brick building still standing today. At the same time, Edward built a remarkable political career. He served as clerk of the house for a remarkable eight Congresses. At that time, he was the longest serving clerk in all of American history. During the interim periods when he wasn't clerk of the house, he served as director of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing president of the Republican National Convention, and published political histories and handbooks to encourage civic literacy and participation. When President Rutherford B. Hayes celebrated Memorial Day in Gettysburg in 1878, he made a special visit to the McPherson family at their home on Carlisle Street. McPherson not only spent his time advocating for the political equality of his fellow man, but also worked to bring black intellectuals into service in the federal government. None were more important to McPherson than Aaron Russell, a free black man from Baltimore. He's a black man, he's born free, and when the Civil War breaks out, he gets a job in Washington, D.C. He's working as a laborer at the Capitol. And this is a Capitol that is slam-packed with laborers because it's a construction site. Aaron Russell somehow catches the eye of Thaddeus Stevens and Ed McPherson. And they go, aha, that guy right there. He looks like he's got potential. And they recognize something in Aaron Russell. I have no clue what it is they recognized in it, but they see it and they go, I've got some jobs, I've got an office. And lo and behold, Aaron Russell gets a job in the office. He's a page. He's running notes back and forth on the floor of Congress. He's delivering documents. He starts becoming a linchpin of McPherson's operation. He eventually worked his way to become a clerk under McPherson, serving the house as a paid employee for 58 years. He was not only a protege of McPherson, but also a deep friend who was regarded by Edward's children with admiration and affection for his manly qualities. He's a friend of Edward McPherson and to the point of he stays in his house when he visits Gettysburg. And he's visiting Gettysburg. Aaron Russell has no ties to the Gettysburg community. There's no rightful reason he should be coming here. There's only one thing that ties him to Gettysburg, Edward McPherson. And so Aaron Russell is coming here to help his boss, not just help his boss 
on dedicating uh, cemeteries, right? Like of giving Memorial Day addresses. No, he's coming here as a political ally to Edward McPherson to mobilize the black Republicans here in town. And when I say black Republicans, I don't mean the pejorative. I mean literally black folks who are Republicans in Gettysburg. When Russell died in 1928, the clerk of the house gave a tearful eulogy. 46 years ago, I entered the office of the clerk of the House of Representatives, a mere boy, and the first to take my hand in a helpful spirit and to become my guide and mentor was he whose mortal remains lie here. I served with him in the Capitol as a subordinate, as an equal, and as a supervisor, and I have always found him the same, true to his ideals, unswerving in his beliefs, and of undoubted rectitude of character. And I want to say to you that you could not find a man whose character furnished a better example. McPherson's commitment to racial equality thus elevated a black man to distinguished service on the dais of the House of Representatives, where he mentored the next generation of House clerks. Far more importantly, it served as a genuine friendship between the two men who worked together closely, broke bread together, and who spent time with one another's families. To say that Edward and his family were engaged in local life would be an understatement. In 1867, while he served as clerk of the house, he also became an owner and editor of one of Gettysburg's Republican papers, The Star and Sentinel. He served as chairman of the Republican County Committee. He became an officer of the Adams County Mutual Fire Insurance Company, president of the gas company, a board member for the Gettysburg and Petersburg Turnpike Committee, and director of the water company, whose ads appeared in the paper he owned. His wife Annie was the treasurer of the local Ladies Aid Society, a local leader and community volunteer, and their children grew up on Gettysburg streets. Throughout all of these various business and philanthropic ventures, however, Edward showed a keen interest in the teaching and preservation of American history, as well as broad investments in education as a whole. In 1861, he became a member of the Pennsylvania College Board of Trustees, where he served on the finance and executive committees. He also became president of the Alumni Association, and all four of his sons graduated from the school. Edward also joined with other prominent citizens, including attorney David Wills, to form the Adams County Historical Society. Edward McPherson, being the editor of a local newspaper called The Star and Sentinel, would have uh, an article occasionally, like every month, about an aspect of local Adams County history. Other people in the area were interested in it. So in 1888, he decided uh, with some other uh, prominent local people that we should start an Adams County Historical Society. Wills, a local Republican, had been a friend to both Edward and Thaddeus Stevens and had graduated from Pennsylvania College two years before Edward. He was primarily responsible for the creation of the National Cemetery and had invited Lincoln to speak at the cemetery's dedication. When Lincoln rode from Washington, D.C. to Gettysburg in November, Edward McPherson rode with him on the train. According to family legend, Lincoln needed writing paper on the ride down in order to draft a small address he would deliver during the ceremony, and Edward provided him the stationery. Whether this detail is true or not, Wills and McPherson both shared positions of authority within the local Republican Party and shared a passion for historic preservation. It seems as if it was more of an afternoon Tuesday tea where some uh, ladies of the town and some prominent gentlemen would get together and there would be someone presenting uh, a historical paper on a topic of local interest or history. Now, this historical society only lasted for about a year uh, and then it folded again. But Edward McPherson was instrumental in the effort to start a movement towards what we have today. Edward's desire to preserve the battlefield for future generations to visit and study was profound. On a philosophical level, Edward's lifelong devotion to the American Union drove him to preserve a great battlefield on which that Union was defended. On a practical level, increased tourism to Gettysburg would also benefit Edward's numerous business investments and strengthen interest in Pennsylvania College. Regardless, Edward's commitment to historical preservation was profound and genuine. To that end, Edward joined the board of directors of the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, which was dedicated to the purchase of land in Gettysburg on which the battle had been fought. As one of the directors, Edward focused primarily on the finances of the organization. Having both inherited and generated great wealth, 
McPherson's business acumen was used to help pull the association from over a decade of debt and secure a financial foundation for the continued acquisition of battlefield land. As post-war tourism to the battlefield increased in the late 19th century, McPherson and the Memorial Association had to compete with private interests encroaching on the historical landscape. Despite the association's best efforts, many of the areas of actual military engagement were still in private hands, and a number of businesses were destroying the landscape and intruding on the historic nature of the site. Next to Devil's Den, Gettysburgian photographer and opportunist William Tipton opened Round Top Park. The site boasted a large pavilion, a merry-go-round, a photo studio, a roller rink, a casino, and numerous restaurants, all next to the iconic stones which had not long ago been strewn with the bodies of eviscerated men. Other restaurants, amusement parks, and saloons elbowed for the attention of interested tourists, returning veterans, and grieving families. No issue was more pressing than the Gettysburg Electric Railway. The passenger trolley line carted visitors throughout town and parts of Cemetery Ridge, but the railway's investors planned on expanding the line and running tracks directly through Devil's Den and the Valley of Death. The expansion would involve not only running a rail car named General Lee through the most important sections of the hallowed battlefield, but also blasting apart terrain features that were in the way, literally blowing up the historical terrain. The GBMA fought fiercely against these expansions, with Edward McPherson's legal expertise being used to deny their requests where possible. The struggle between competing interest groups continued for years, until in 1893, the Memorial Association had had enough. Led by Edward McPherson, a group of 40 prominent community members in conjunction with the GBMA brought formal charges against the railway company for illegal and shameful acts which led to scandal and discredit of the Commonwealth. Edward served as a lawyer representing the people, both helping move the charges through the local courts and coordinating county legislation to prevent further expansion by the railway company. The issue continued to move through the courts and it quickly became clear that McPherson's charge would go all the way to the Supreme Court. At the same time, Congress was debating legislation to establish a national military park owned and operated by the United States in order to preserve American military history and train future soldiers. Edward was placed in charge of determining whether the land owned by the Memorial Association could be transferred to the government legally, and by 1895, he had laid the internal groundwork to transfer the land. In May, McPherson helped oversee the transfer of 600 acres of land, 17 miles of roads, and 320 monuments. The, the first and foremost threat in their minds was simply that the landscape would revert to what it had been pre-war, that farmers would continue to use the land in the way that they had done so before. And if all of that land remained in private hands, how could generations of visitors come and pay homage there? The organization deemed itself redundant following the transfer and they stopped meeting except to continue the legal battle against the electric railway. On top of all this work, McPherson sought to preserve the story of his closest friend, dearest mentor, and critical political partner. Thaddeus Stevens, who had been a major presence throughout all of McPherson's life, grew very ill in the years after the war ended. Forever fighting against President Johnson, Stevens became so sick that he wasn't able to walk on his own. In order to enter the Senate chambers, he had to be carried on a chair by assistance. Unable to complete the delivery of his own speeches, he had to hand them off to friends to read for him, McPherson being one of them. Unfortunately, none of Edward's friendship could assist in Stevens' battle against mortality. On August 11th, 1868, Thaddeus Stevens died in pain in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. McPherson mourned the loss heavily and bemoaned that a man of such courage had passed from the earth. His loss will be most seriously felt. We have many men in our ranks who otherwise are of remarkable ability but who are sadly deficient in that respect. As one of Stephen's closest friends, McPherson was made an executor of his will. With an unsurprising level of historical foresight, McPherson foresaw the controversial nature of Stephen's role in American culture and memory, and endeavored to create a definitive biography of the man, written by one of his closest confidants and allies. In an era of monument construction and literary battles about whose account of the past would become cemented in public history, McPherson understood the importance of establishing and securing an accurate historical narrative. As research by historian Evan Rothera has uncovered, McPherson boldly reaffirmed slavery as the cause of secession, unwilling to allow post-war reconciliation efforts to obscure the reality of the war. In a speech to the local Grand Army of the Republic chapter, McPherson put it as plainly as possible. All the world saw and knew the power when those events were transpiring. 
The safety of slavery was thus the motive power which brought into being the Southern Confederacy, and the permanency of slavery was the inspiration which nerved that people to meet the disasters which ultimately pressed them to the earth. McPherson was furious at the concerted effort and progress on many hands, in books, in magazines, in lectures, in newspapers, to becloud the issue as then plainly and acutely made, to pervert the positions then deliberately assumed, to blot out the admissions and the boasts then publicly made, to falsely state the history of those great events, and to pretend that instead of fighting for the perpetuation of slavery, they were really fighting for civil liberty. McPherson had spent his entire career fighting for the Union and seeking to advance American liberty, both by advocating for governmental investment in American business and by fighting against the bondage of human slavery. And seeing his contemporaries deny the facts of what he had fought for, his town had been ravaged for, and his friends had died for, drove a nonstop frenzy of entrepreneurship, preservation, and activism. By keeping safe his county's history, the land of America's greatest battle, and the public's memory of those terrible years, McPherson continued to fight for the nation's future. This fight, as it always had, drew McPherson's passion to dozens of places, actions, and efforts. The Electric Railway case, the Stevens biography, and dozens of business investments were chief among them. All of these ideas and issues jostled for space inside the 65-year-old Edwards' mind, his days full of meetings, legal litigation, business activity, political advising, historical publishing, educational evaluations, journalistic investigations, and of course, the growing brood of grandchildren visiting the family home on Carlisle Street. Edward's mind was capable of keeping up with this incredible juggling act, though his body was slowing down. The health issues which prevented him from studying law in his youth required daily medication. One wonders then whether Edward McPherson was thinking about the electric railway litigation or the next chapter of his Stevens biography or what gift to surprise Annie with after her vacation with the kids, when on the evening of December 13th, 1895, he went to take his standard heart medicine. Perhaps he was distracted by a dinner conversation, as one newspaper reported. As soon as he swallowed the drink, though, he felt something was wrong. As the Gettysburg compiler, his own paper's competitor, reported, It seems two bottles of medicine were near together, the second one a strong and powerful poison mix, of which only a few drops were to be taken. But Mr. McPherson, not knowing of course of his mistake, took of this second bottle the usual amount, as if of his own preparation. The New York Times reported this second bottle as Nux Vomica, a combination of two toxic chemicals used throughout the 19th century for a variety of ills. Accounts vary as to what happened next, some peaceful, others gruesome. He rushed quickly to the office of Dr. Horner, a Gettysburgian who had treated soldiers in the aftermath of the battle and who, in a twist of irony, lived in the former home of Thaddeus Stevens. Doctors throughout town were called to the home, but nothing could be done quickly enough. His body convulsed for hours, causing extreme pain and exacerbating the condition of his heart. Newspapers indicate that he groaned in agony for over 12 hours, two of his sons by his side. Early in the morning of December 14th, Edward McPherson finally became quiet and died shortly thereafter. In the words of the Gettysburg compiler, And thus came the death of one of the best known men ever born and raised in our county. Annie and his two other children, who were on a trip out of town, were immediately summoned back. Any excitement for their vacation was cut short by Edward's mysterious, surprising, and sudden death. The body rested in the family home for days until a funeral was held inside. The pallbearers at his funeral formed a squad of Gettysburg royalty. The Swopes, the McKnights, the Crawfords, and of course, the McPhersons. The compiler had nothing but kindness to give for their stalwart enemy, writing, His advice was frequently sought by his friends and always given freely. He was an affable man and always a gentleman. His friends were numerous, and he had the entire respect of the people of his community for his learning and ability. He leaves behind a grief-stricken family who have the sympathy of all. His death is to be regretted, especially so as it happened under such unfortunate circumstances, attended with many conditions which make it doubly sorrowful. McPherson's own paper spent multiple pages listing his accomplishments and attributes, but affirmed his importance to Gettysburg above all else. Of Mr. McPherson's charming personality, his great abilities, his deep and thorough learning, his starting integrity, his splendid judgment, his broad-minded Christian charity, there is no need to speak. He was Gettysburg's greatest son. How great will be entirely appreciated only when we realize that he has gone from us forever. 
In the cold winds of December, Edward was buried in Gettysburg's Evergreen Cemetery. McPherson died unexpectedly, dozens of pressing issues left unattended, projects unfinished, and problems unsolved. His work with the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association would continue without him, evolving into the modern National Military Park, which benefits millions of visitors a year, not to mention his beloved hometown. The lawsuit he originated against the electric railway went all the way to the Supreme Court, whose decision expanded government's ability to preserve and protect historic land. The GBMA is critical to the development of Gettysburg National Military Park as, a, as, as an institution. Preserving the battlefield to me is important, and I think other people think that's important too. And let's say if they knew that, then they would wonder, okay, well, who did this, right? Um, I just think many people would not know who did it because he doesn't get that recognition. And it's not that, it, you know, I don't want him to be like, famous like Dwayne Johnson or whatever, but it's, I, I do feel like sometimes he doesn't get much recognition. Uh, he's not the person that you look to in the headlines. Instead, he's the guy that gets stuff done. And for me, with McPherson, that's really the intriguing thing about him, is that he is a workhorse when it comes to getting things done, particularly in the local uh, political machine. He is the fulcrum around which republicanism and therefore abolitionism kind of cranks and, and moves in this area. I think locally, Edward McPherson has already, always been a big deal. And that we've always thought that the McPherson family are very prominent members of the community. Edward McPherson was the first of four generations of McPhersons serving people in critical public roles. Edward's son, my grandfather, Donald McPherson, was elected Assemblyman and State Senator in Harrisburg prior to being judge of Adams and Fulton counties for 20 years. My father, Donald McPherson Jr., also a lawyer, was elected State Senator from Adams County and appointed by President Eisenhower to the Interstate Commerce Commission in Washington regulating the transportation industries. I was appointed by President George W. Bush, Bush 43, and confirmed by the Senate as the Undersecretary of Education of the United States and previously the Chief Financial Officer of the United States Department of Agriculture, as well as a member of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Advisory Council. But, you know, outside of the local area, uh, he hasn't received the notoriety that he probably deserves. The Adams County Historical Society faltered and closed, but would be revived a handful of times. Today, the society is healthy, continuing to save the artifacts of people throughout the county, and just this year opening a state-of-the-art facility which tells their stories, including a number of items from McPherson's political career. His leadership at Pennsylvania College would help grow his alma mater into the nationally recognized Gettysburg College, which boasts remarkable history and Civil War era studies programs. I see McPherson speaking very powerfully to a, a throughput of values that have been true from Gettysburg, about Gettysburg College um, for almost two centuries now. So what lessons can we take from McPherson's life? I mean, one is the importance of what Teddy Roosevelt would have said, getting in the arena, right? Democracy is not a spectator sport. And McPherson took that seriously, right? He um, uh, decided to devote his life to public service, at least in, significant, in a significant respect. And he brought about profound change. The legislation he saw passed during his decades as clerk of the House included the abolition of slavery, the codification of the right to vote for black men, and the extension of citizenship to all people born in the United States, regardless of race. Though the fight to protect and realize these constitutional guarantees is still not yet settled, McPherson was a key player in advancing equality in his time. My name is Cynthia McPherson, but I usually go by Cindy. and. Edward McPherson was my two times great-grandfather. Another way that Edward's work relates to my work is that I was working with an organization that's about ending mass incarceration. And one of our biggest issues is the continuation of slavery that the 13th Amendment allows if it's in the context of people who are incarcerated. And so, again, it's just another way that at the time of the 13th Amendment, I don't think anybody was planning to leave a huge loophole, but then over time you see how it's played out. Countless students, politicians, and citizens read his handbooks on politics 
his histories of the Civil War period, and his pamphlets on local history. I was always enamored by his ability uh, to take in information and then to lay out that information uh, in an understandable manner and then, you know, recite it to, uh, you know, whether he's writing in his newspaper or uh, speaking in one of his lectures. Communicating effectively sustains Edwards' legacy. He wrote thick books, addressed Congress, and made many speeches. In turn, Judge McPherson, followed by Donald McPherson Jr., were both good communicators. I testified in Congress several times and have made lots of public speaking appearances. Today, our son Edward McPherson Jr. has published three significant books and many articles as a professor of creative writing and a Guggenheim Fellow. McPherson's beloved family has continued to grow and today carries on his legacy in memory and action. The importance of family is also vital to Edward McPherson's legacy. He built his home in Gettysburg in 1870, which six generations of the McPherson family enjoyed over the next 150 years. We hosted numerous local people and guests from all over the world. Our daughter Beth shared Edward, the Gettysburg home, and her love of history, civil rights, and social justice with large groups of her students. Um, when I hear the name McPherson, I think of my dad. It's gonna make me cry a little bit. I think of my dad. Uh, he was the third Donald P. McPherson. And I think of Gettysburg. Sometimes I just feel like since I'm part of their blood, their accomplishments inspire me. They really do. Um, the things that my grandfather did really inspires me. He used to do just advice in Maryland, which is helping people with law that couldn't afford a lawyer and it was part of the University of Maryland. So, I mean, he was very dedicated to his work and he was very dedicated to spending time with family too. You know, I, I really miss him a lot, so. McPherson's greatest failure was his Stevens biography, which was never finished. Stevens' reputation would be forever marred by segregationists and ex-Confederates who depicted him as a cruel despot who committed the unthinkable sin of opposing slavery. Only in recent years, especially after the film Lincoln, would his reputation as a defender of freedom begin to emerge from the ashes. In 2022, a statue of Thaddeus Stevens was erected just outside of the Adams County Courthouse thanks to the work of the Thaddeus Stevens Society. The beautiful statue joins the thousands of others in Gettysburg. Yet McPherson has never been memorialized in the same way. His name does appear in three places. First, on the monument to Company K, located on the Gettysburg Town Square. Second, on the monument to the high watermark of the rebellion, alongside the names of every director of the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. Third, as the primary name for the ridge upon which his farm sat. No memorial indicates his importance to this town. No monument depicts him calling the vote on the 13th Amendment or protecting Reconstruction by not calling Confederate names. No statue underscores just how central he was to this town for half a century. Once you know where to look, though, McPherson appears everywhere. His fingerprints are left in the documents of the historical institutions throughout this town. His home has been sold to the college, and the parlor where his body lay in rest now serves the students at his alma mater and the school to which he devoted many resources and decades of advice. Tourists flock to his farm to see where the battle began, and military service members stand on a ridge with his name to understand age-old military delaying tactics. Numerous families raised their children in homes rented from Edward McPherson, and his political shrewdness brought the nation's finest to his front porch, including presidents and Black House clerks he handpicked to serve in the highest legislative bodies in the country. And his newspaper remains a critical resource for understanding the tumultuous period in Gettysburg. It is impossible to capture everything about McPherson, but the closer one looks, the clearer the simple facts become. Little Nettie truly was Gettysburg's greatest son. He was not perfect, and he had to grow into the man he became, but Edward developed from the privileged descendant of slave owners into a true advocate for equality, dedicated to an American Union whose greatest possibilities he always believed in. The clouds of war, assassination, political failure, and inequality never dissuaded him from carrying the nation towards the future. McPherson was not a president, or a great general, or a world-famous author, but he was constant, always pushing for the future, and he stood by his principles courageously. Those issues he addressed, 
racial equality, labor protection, historical revisionism, all remain in the imperfect nation whose best possibilities he always believed in. The issues he failed to address, women's rights, government corruption, unsustainable industrialization, join them, clear indications that like McPherson, his country full of opportunity and promise has much work left to do. An evaluation of McPherson's life doesn't just provide the details of his past, but also issues a charge to those who carry on his legacy to confront those issues which demand our attention fearlessly, to grow beyond the work and weaknesses of the past, and to make the things we choose to believe in worth believing in. Perhaps a single question remains as to his legacy, one which will likely endure for generations, yet has a definitive answer. How do I pronounce the name, whether it's McPherson or McPherson? McPherson. McPherson. I kind of use them interchangeably. McPherson. Ed McPherson. Edward McPherson. Edward McPherson. McPherson. Edward McPherson. Edward McPherson himself. We say it's McPherson, and we jokingly refer to there's no fear in McPherson. So it's not McPherson, it's McPherson. But it's McPherson. If you want to ask how to pronounce our name, we will tell you there's no fear in McPherson. Thank you.